We're very happy to have with us back Dr. Norman E. Rosenthal and the super mind. Dr. Rosenthal is currently clinical professor of psychiatry at Georgetown University of Medicine and is listed as one of the best doctors in America. Dr. Rosenthal has practiced psychiatry for over three decades, treating people afflicted by various psychiatric and emotional issues. He's also a motivational speaker and a personal and professional coach working with people from all walks of life, including CEOs, top athletes, and performing artists. Born and raised in South Africa, he did his psychiatric residency at Columbia in New York City before going to the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. His first major research contribution was to describe and name seasonal affective disorder, otherwise known as SAD, and to develop light therapy as a treatment for this novel condition. Of course, I'm not sure if we suffer so much from that in South Florida, but we have a lot of light here. <laughs> Dr. Rosenthal is a highly cited researcher who has written over 200 scholarly articles and authored or co-authored eight popular books. He's conducted numerous clinical trials of medications and alternative treatments such as transcendental meditation for psychiatric disorders and post-traumatic stress disorder. He and his work have been featured on Good Morning America, The Today Show, NPR, and other national media. Also, today's event is sponsored with collaboration with the Miami Transcendental Meditation Center. Please give him a nice Books and Books welcome, Dr. Norman Rosenthal. Well, thank you so much for that warm Miami welcome. And thanks to all of you who are coming in here on this beautiful day, um, getting out of out of your glorious sunlight to listen to me. I hope it'll be worth it, or I shall make it so. Let's let's put it that way. Positive thinking. Um, you know, all the different places where I've talked, I normally wear a shirt and a tie and a jacket, a suit, and this is not speaking down to you all from Miami, this is a tribute to the wonderful casual atmosphere that is the reason why people flock to you in millions and thousands. And um, I'm very happy to be here and to be very casual in sharing with you something that for me is very special. So let me tell you a little bit about my story and how I come to be here. I had done Transcendental Meditation in South Africa in the early 1970s. And I was a medical student at the time, and it was kind of a fad, you know. It was the time when the Beatles had just visited Maharishi in India, and slogans such as flower power and make love not war were all around. And part of that was the idea that you went to your local little place and you learned, got your mantra and you learned TM and it was the cool thing to do. And I am afraid to say that I didn't really take it as seriously as I should have. I thought it was just a cool thing and I let it fall off my priority list. And so it was for 35 years that I didn't meditate. And in retrospect, that first time around, I never got it. Um, so I'm sitting in my office, my private practice office, 35 years later, and a young man with bipolar disorder says to me, you know, the medicines you're giving me are all good and well, but what's making me really happy 90% of the time is my transcendental meditation. Oh, yeah, I say, I did that back when, and we talked to and fro. And he said, you know, you should get back to it. So, you know, I thought to myself, you know, 20 minutes twice a day, where am I going to find the time? But I kind of nodded my head, and he persisted. He didn't let me off the hook, and finally introduced me to the person to whom the book is actually dedicated, Bob Roth, wonderful TM teacher whom I met, who refreshed my technique, and so I started to meditate. My patient checked up on me and said, are you doing it? I said, yeah. He said, have you noticed anything? I said, not really. He said, well, are you doing it regularly? I said, not really. He said, that's the key. You have to do it regularly if you're going to get an effect. So I started doing it regularly. And little by little, I actually felt a change come about. Now, you know, we psychiatrists, we're trained to kind of look within. How are we responding? If a patient is telling me something and I'm uncomfortable, 
What is it inside me that is being triggered to feel uncomfortable about this information? So we're, we're kind of fine-tuned to learn what's going on inside ourselves. And I saw something really curious was going on here. I was becoming calmer. I wasn't sweating the small stuff. I was rolling better with the punches. And so I began to recommend it to my patients, and I did some research on it in post-traumatic stress disorder and bipolar disorder. And then I started looking into the literature, and what I found there was really hundreds of articles, excellent articles, showing how transcendental meditation helps people physically, their cardiovascular system, helps people psychologically, like with anxiety or post-traumatic stress disorder, and I began to recommend it. And then I began to see what changes occurred in my patients. So I thought, wow, look at this. I'm feeling different. All this literature is out there. I'm seeing it helping my patients, sometimes very dramatically. A young man with PTSD who came back from Iraq who had undergone an explosion in a vehicle that he was driving along a booby-trapped road, uh, just really was suffering terribly, flashbacks, insomnia, um, and it was, it was ruining his life, he couldn't study, his relationship suffered, and he was drinking a lot of vodka just to sort of damp down the intense feelings that he was having, started to meditate, and bit by bit, all of this kind of ebbed away. Stopped, medi stopped medicating, I should say. Started meditating and stopped medicating. He began to have a better relationship with his girlfriend. His studies flourished. His life turned around. So there was so much there that as a writer, which I have been now for 27 years, as a writer, I, I thought, I have to write about this. I have to take my background in psychiatry, in research, and my personal experience and my clinical experience, synthesize it, and I wrote Transcendence, which luckily was a New York Times bestseller, and I was very glad I did it, but I didn't think I had anything more to say about the subject. So here I am five years later, and here's another book also related to Transcendental Meditation. So you could legitimately say why. Why was there any need for another book on the subject? Hadn't you said it all? Well, obviously, I haven't. If I had said it all, you wouldn't have 320 pages or whatever it is of new stuff. And the reason I wrote another book was that as I continued to meditate, I saw a lot of amazing things begin to happen in my daily life. Because one of the key elements of transcendental meditation is, as the name implies, transcendence. And I'm actually going to read to you a quote from a great classical psychologist called William James. Because when people hear about other stages of consciousness, it really sounds woo-woo. It really sounds like, what have you been smoking here? But the answer is simple. I haven't been smoking anything. I've just been meditating. And I want to read to you a quote by the classical psychologist William James, early 20th century, known as the father of psychology. He wrote many, many wise and wonderful things, and here is one of them. And I'm reading it to you because I put it right at the front of the book. But I didn't really understand how profound it was until I read it a few times over. He says, our normal waking consciousness is but one special type of consciousness, whilst all about it, parted from it by the filmiest of screens, there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. Okay, so we all know we have waking, sleeping, and dreaming, ordinary states of consciousness. But what he's saying is that outside of our ordinary experience, with the thinnest of screens, exist other states of consciousness, which I've called expanded consciousness. And I'm going to read it 
again for my dear friend Dave and his buddy who've just driven all the way from Miami. I'm talking about William James and what he said over a hundred years ago. He said, our normal waking consciousness is but one special type of consciousness while all about it, parted from it by the filmiest of screens, there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. He anticipated other states of consciousness. A classical psychologist, not some guru come down from the Himalayas, straight down the middle, classical psychologist. We may go through life, he says, without suspecting their existence, but apply the requisite stimulus, and at a touch they are there in all their completeness. So we could live with just waking, sleeping, and dreaming. What here, though, is the requisite stimulus? Well, maybe you can get these other states of consciousness in many different ways. But in my experience, the most effortless, easiest way to access them is through this technique of transcendental meditation. This is the requisite stimulus. Definite types of mentality, he says, which probably somewhere have their field of application and adaptation. Somewhere, he says, these states of consciousness have a value, a use, a purpose. They're not just kind of things to go tripping out on because it's fun. They actually have a value to them. No account of the universe, he says, in its totality can be final, which leaves these other forms of consciousness quite disregarded. And that's very, very validating because I've now spent a couple of years uh, studying, researching these other states of consciousness. And isn't it nice to get validated by this father of psychology who says no account of the universe is complete without understanding these other states of consciousness. They are not frivolous, they are not irrelevant, they're not valueless, they are a crucial thing to understand if you want to understand the universe, and here I think he means the psychological universe, in its entirety. So that is what started to percolate and develop within me. A sense that during the day, the transcendent experience which I had during my meditation filters into my daily life. Now I'm going to ask you to show hands, all of you who already meditate here and those who don't meditate. So, well, I'm glad that there's some who don't meditate because you're the ones that are in for the special treat by learning about the, the gifts that can accrue when you meditate. But I think even amongst those of us who meditate, it's always wonderful to hear some extra tip, some extra lead, some extra view or vision of what lies down the road as our meditation deepens and grows. And that's how it was for me, because those of you and those of us who meditate know that during the actual meditation, we experience transcendence. And what transcendence is, is it's a state where you're alert, awake, but very calm. And that's kind of unusual, you know, because usually when you're alert, you're kind of jazzed, or when you're uh, uh, calm, you're kind of sluggish. But here, you're both alert and calm. Boundaries uh, seem to disappear. Is it Tuesday? Is it Thursday? Is it 9 in the morning or 3 in the afternoon? I don't care. I'm in the transcendence. So that's where I am. And then 20 minutes later, you emerge, and that's all fine. So of course, you have to somehow keep track of real time. Sometimes people do that with a little app. Sometimes your brain just knows it's 20 minutes and time to move on. But anyway, that is the transcendence. And the nicest piece of all that I've left for last is that it's very blissful. And it has been compared to going down deep into the ocean. And my friend Bob Roth has this lovely image that he shares of the ocean. And if you're on the surface, there may be 20 foot waves and those look like everything is turbulent and everything is, it's a storm going on. 
But if you go down into the depths, the ocean is calm, there are no waves, there's no storm. And that's kind of how it is. As we sit down to meditate, our lives may be turbulent, but as we go down, as though we're going down in a diving bell, to the depths and essence of who we are, it's very blissful. And when you repeatedly visit a part of yourself that feels so joyful and so pleasant and calm, it begins to embed in you a sense of, you know, I'm kind of a nice person and I want to behave in a nice way. That anger, that meanness, that malice that I sometimes feel, maybe I don't actually need to act on it. Maybe I can just let it pass. You know, it's, it's kind of organic. It's not something you necessarily address these issues directly. They happen indirectly through the effects of the transcendent experience that then moves into your daily life. Okay, so in the book Transcendence, I came across a mysterious quote from the Upanishads, which are ancient Vedic texts that go back thousands of years. And the quote that was there that I included was as follows. It says, there's a mind within the mind, a mind beyond the mind. Dwell there and never dwell anywhere else. Okay, so I thought this was such a wonderful description of the transcendent state. A mind within the mind, a mind beyond the mind. You know, you're sitting there, you apply the requisite stimulus, which is TM, and then the screen lifts and you go into this other state of consciousness. And it's very interesting that our fiction anticipates this. Whether you're talking about Alice in Wonderland going through the looking glass, falling down the rabbit hole, Harry Potter, you know, going to a station that nobody knows exists and all of a sudden a, a portal opens up and the Hogwarts Express comes and takes him away and so on and so forth, embedded in our fictive imagination, which must be somehow represented in our unconscious, is the idea that the world has these secret passages, trapdoors, things that if you just press the button in the right way, will open up and let you go into this other world. Now, I must ask you to excuse me for a moment. I must be allergic to something because my nose is itching something awful. Cut that out of the li live stream. <laughs> That's a joke because you can't cut anything out of the live stream. So my itchy nose is now immortalized. What can I say? Anyway, so back to this mysterious quote from the Upanishads, and that is, dwell there, okay, it's a good place, it's a mind within the mind, it's the mind without, beyond the mind, but don't dwell anywhere else. That seemed very odd to me. You know, we've got to make a living, we've got things to do, we've got places to go, we've got people to see. How are we going to be dwelling in this wonderful mind within the mind? And I just kind of left it because, you know, sometimes you think, well, that's what the quote says, and it's kind of been around for a long time, and it's often quoted, and there must be some embedded wisdom in it, so I'll just leave it in place, even though I don't understand it. And then, as the transcendent feeling moved into my daily life, then I understood the quote. And that is that the transcendence moves into your conscious waking state. And so what is happening after a while, and it's very variable from person to person. Some people can, what, what, one thing I discovered in writing the book is that some people experience this, which I've called supermind, very early on and report very wonderful experiences. In others, it grows slowly and incrementally. But what it basically is, is a calmness that exists side by side with your daily activity. But calmness makes you sound, makes it sound like maybe you've taken a Valium. But it's not like that. It's also an aliveness. There's a vibrancy and a vitality. For example, sometimes I'll be writing and I'll get blocked. The words just won't come. William Styron once spoke about it like the syrup was there, but the syrup wouldn't pour. 
you knew it was somewhere there, the words, the ideas, but they just wouldn't come out. And that's how it feels. And then I do my 20 minutes of meditation and all of a sudden the syrup pours again. Something has happened physiologically at the level of the brain. We don't know what that thing is. It's akin to how a good night's sleep helps you wake up with a fresh mind and approach a problem in a new way and solve things that you couldn't solve before. Something physiological is going on and they're beginning to understand that in relation to sleep. What they're beginning to understand is that the nerve cells, the neurons move apart a little bit and that the cerebrospinal fluid basically washes out the waste products of metabolism. And they think that that might be how sleep has this refreshing effect. Well, TM has a refreshing effect as well, and I have no idea whether this mechanism also applies there. So there you are operating in your waking state on two channels. Right now, for example, I am really engaged in what I'm telling you. I'm really excited. I'm so happy to see so many people dragging themselves out of the beautiful Miami sunshine to listen here and join me in the celebration, really, of the growth of the supermind. And at the same time, it's really peaceful. I don't, you know, th th there's a wonderful, we'll get to that. W what I'm really talking about is one of the gifts of the supermind, I'll jump ahead, is the balance between engagement and detachment. Because when we, and Steve, tell me, how, what is my timeline like? I don't want to. <laughs> I promise you, I will not go till midnight. I, I just d didn't want to hear that the place was closing in three minutes. So. Apparently not. Anyway, um, learning to become a psychiatrist, we did what Freud advised, which was the goals of life, he said, were to love and to work. You have to love people, you have to engage with people, you have to get into relationships, you have to work, you have to do things, you have to create things, you have to earn money, etc., etc., etc. But what was not emphasized in my training was what about detachment? What about when a relationship isn't working? Or when a job is not fulfilling or a career is not fulfilling? That's when we have to actually pull back and detach. How do we know when to hold them and when to fold them? How do we detach gracefully? How do we experience the loss? Because I don't know out there, maybe some of you have broken up with a relationship. Show by show of hands, who's ever broken up a relationship? A lot of people. And you know that even a relationship where you need to break up, there are feelings of loss. So those need to be weathered, those need to be withstood. And so there has to be a balance between engagement and detachment. That's one of my chapters. Engagement and detachment, a delicate dance. So here I am talking to you, deeply engaged in what I'm doing, because I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But at the same time, let's say nobody wanted to buy a book, for example. That would be okay, because this is all about promoting knowledge. This is all about sharing joy and sharing an engagement in something. And it sh one shouldn't be overattached. You know, you do your best. There's a wonderful um, verse in the Bhagavad Gita that says, we have control over action alone, never the fruits. And then it goes on to say, therefore, don't be overattached to the fruits, nor be detached from the action. So it's very tricky. Don't get over invested in the result, but you can't just say, okay, I'm not even going to try because it probably won't work out anyway. So this kind of wonderful balance that comes that is fostered by the state of what has been called cosmic consciousness, the growth of consciousness, is, and I just have to say, Hello to a very wonderful friend of mine who's just walked in, George Crowley. Nice to see you. Um, in any event, this kind of wonderful balance, um, don't be overattached, don't be overdetached. Just the Buddhist expression, which 
refers to the rider and a horse, not too tight, not too loose. Just get that balance right. That is what this process of the unfoldment of consciousness enables you to do. The calm side by side with deep engagement, the same alert calmness, the same combination between calmness and vibrancy that is something that I have come to treasure that is the result of the meditation. So as you see, supermind goes way beyond what was in transcendence. In transcendence, I really wrote about what to me was like a miracle that this practice, TM, could help people as diverse as homeless people, people addicted to drugs, in prisons, in disadvantaged schools, anxious people, people at risk for cardiovascular disease, all of these amazingly diverse people who are in distressed circumstances can benefit from the simple technique that is sort of virtually free of any side effects. I, I mean, I had to write about it. It was so amazing to me and so exciting to me. But then as I continued to meditate, what became even more exciting was the idea that any of us regardless of our circumstances. It doesn't matter if we're quite happy with our lives, it doesn't matter where we are in our lives, can benefit from this continued growth. Now, um, over here, Levi, Levi, is it Ellenby or Ellerby? Levi Ellenby, and uh, the son of the local Kiki, famous Kiki, TM teacher and uh, took me. He just drove me. I never, we never met before. And I turned around to him, asked him if he meditates. Yes, he meditates. What has it done for you? So, well, you know, I've just meditated for the last couple of years. And then he went on to say how it has really helped organize his thinking, really helped him prioritize his activities, prioritize things in his life. It basically if I may paraphrase, has restructured the way his mind is working. And, you know, it was so, sort of so obvious that this was just an authentic description of what had happened to him that I literally felt chills at that. And I'll explain to you why. Because sometimes, you know, when you get so excited about something um, and you really think it's fantastic and you need to tell everybody about it, if you have an element of skepticism within you and a questioning mind as I do, you have to ask yourself as I did and do, have I gone overboard here? Am I overselling my product? Am I exaggerating things? And I thought, wow, no, I'm not. Here's just somebody that I'm just asking. I never sought him out. I never did a survey and took the best answer out of a hundred. I just took anybody, and that's the answer I got. So this is a young person, and I think this is really, really valuable for people to know that the growth of the super mind is like compound interest. And as any financial advisor will tell you, you should start saving and investing young, because what will emerge from that process benefits from this compounding effect and the benefits expand, grow and multiply geometrically over time. And that's what I would say to anybody watching the live. The young people, I would say start at any age. Neighbor of mine, mid 80s, cancer patient, found me on the web, said, hey Norman, is it worth my while starting? I've got cancer, I'm in my mid-80s. I said, absolutely. Absolutely. It, it helps the quality of life. Can't say it'll do anything necessarily for the actual illness, but it'll make you feel differently. Hooked him up with a local TM teacher, and then I tried to call him to see how he was doing, and I couldn't reach him because his wife kept saying, can't reach him, he's busy meditating. And loving it and thank you for sending him to meditation I, I didn't know what to do with him and now we're having a good time and when I ran into him he said you know 
I'm even thinking of traveling to China. I said, well, you know, China's a long way away. I, I didn't say it, but I thought, wow, you know, I don't know if he ever went or not. But the fact that he felt like it and the fact that he thought he could go and that he had the enthusiasm to go was a wonderful thing to hear. But back to my point. So if you happen to be 86, God forbid you're suffering from a terrible illness. I hope you're all well. Do it anyway. But if you're a young person like Levi, you've got a long lifespan ahead of you. Invest early. Sometimes a patient of mine says, oh, doc, I'm so sorry. I, I fell off the wagon for two weeks and I wasn't meditating. I said, that's okay. I can understand. I fell off the wagon for 35 years. <laughs> Don't be like me. Learn from my lesson. It's been, the last eight years have been so joyful and such a voyage of discovery that I wish it for all, especially the young people whose whole lives can be altered. And I'm, I'm sort of being very, very selfish in this vision because you young men and women, it, the world, the future of the world is in your hands. And if you can approach it with organization in your thinking and a sense of vibrant detachment and all the gifts of the supermind, then um, that would be good for all of us. Now, back to William James for a moment. And um, quoting him, um, I have taken his advice in his marvelous book, The Varieties of Religious Experience. What he says, in my belief that a large acquaintance with particulars often makes us wiser than the possession of abstract formulas, however deep, I have loaded the lectures with concrete examples. And that's what I've done. But instead of concrete examples, I would say fascinating stories. Stories of people who are artists, directors, comedians, hedge fund owners, and homemakers, a homeless person, veterans. It covers the whole spectrum. I had the joy and privilege of having breakfast earlier in the week with one of the people featured, the prima ballerina in the New York City Ballet, Megan Fairchild. And... Um, we were supposed to be on a TV program together. She has meditated, and um, the TV program couldn't have us. So I wrote to her, and I said, you know, my biggest disappointment is I was just looking forward to meeting you in person. How about coming over for breakfast? She said, I'm in. I'm there. Well, we had breakfast together, and, you know, she is so vibrant and so bursting with life and energy and natural charm and nothing forced at all very authentic person and here's her story as a dancer she started having fainting episodes and these were threatening her career you can imagine if you're a dancer you, nobody can afford to have you flaking out on the stage she started meditating the fainting episodes vanished entirely but she kept meditating and what happened then is that her mind kept expanding. And she'd been very perfectionistic and averse to risk in the past, but now she was open to the possibility of taking risks, recognizing that if you never take chances, you're gonna miss a lot of opportunities. And so it was that they were putting out a request for auditions for a Broadway show on the town. They wanted an a dancer who could act well she could dance like a goddess as somebody later said but she'd never acted she'd never sung she had actually fears of doing that but thanks to the TM she took the chance auditioned got the part in the room went on to a year of rave reviews both for her and the show made a whole world of new friends and opportunities and as a consequence, her whole life has changed. Now she's back dancing again, but she's off to uh, San Francisco to do a musical version of the Broadway show. So 
basically, why I'm talking about her is you can start it for maybe stabilizing your physiology like she did. But heaven knows where it's going to lead you if you just keep going and if you're just open-minded. I mean, did I know it was going to lead me to another book or being here and talking with all of you and meeting you? Paths open up. Another thing, and as I'm talking, I realize there's just too much here. There are too many interesting people, stories for me to tell you all. Let me drop a few names. Um, Martin Scorsese, the director, says he organizes his day. Jerry Seinfeld, let me let them just get the audio straight before I blast your ears off. Jerry Seinfeld, the comedian, attributes his energy to TM, whereby he is still doing the exhausting job of stand-up, even when many of his contemporaries have fallen by the wayside. Cameron Diaz used TM to remember her lines on a boiling hot day in the LA Zoo when they were filming. Barry Zito, former all-star baseball pitcher, was able to stay in the zone in a memorable game in the playoffs that, went, that enabled the San Francisco Giants to go on to win the World Series, and on and on and on. And a homeless man who's used TM to straighten out his life, formerly in jail, in, in, in not in jail, in federal penitentiary, for drugs, for violence, for all kinds of things. Now, having a job in the streets of New York, cleaning the streets of New York, I found him, it was an organization that got him that position, saying that it's so wonderful for people to nod their heads and smile and to feel like he's joined a uh, civilized society. And he says, you know, at lunchtime, I go into Central Park and I sit on the hillside and I close my eyes and I meditate and I listen to the birds singing in Central Park and there's nothing more joyful than that to me. So the entire spectrum every kind of activity and I could go on and on uh, but I won't because I'm sure that you all have questions I haven't answered all the questions but hopefully I've whet your appetite and having said unstable um, mental state that needs to be stabilized before they go ahead and learn 
these TM teachers have been very thoroughly trained to catch such people, help them get squared away with the right help. And incidentally, I, I don't see TM as an alternative to conventional help, but as an adjunct, as a very wonderful tool. I use it all the time in conjunction with all the other things that a psychiatrist or a psychologist might use. But yes, so the effects are really negligible, but I would never say never. Other questions? Over there, gentleman in the peach colored shirt. That is such a good question because that is perhaps one of the biggest disappointments that people have expressed. TM, like many um, types of art, like martial arts, ballet, playing the piano, swimming, anything that is a, a something you have to get the hang of is actually taught by trained teachers. We've just been talking about teachers who need to spot if there's an instability or a problem that might need you to slow down the process. This is taught by trained teachers. That's how it's been for the last 50 plus years. So I really don't want to mislead anybody to think that they will actually get a cookbook of how to do it. So when people ask me, is this a how-to book? I say, no, it's a why-to book. Because if you think about it, our most precious and finite assets and resources is our time. 20 minutes twice a day compounded over the course of a long time is a lot of time and it's a big investment. And in order to even venture along the journey and take that plunge, you have to feel relatively confident that the time and energy will be repaid. And so that's basically what these books are. They are to uh, indicate why it will be repaid and how it will be repaid and encourage you and stimulate you. In addition, this book, Supermind, my surprise at finding out how soon these Supermind changes occur. In fact, the book should help those people because what it's being compared to is being in a dark room and having a light turned on very, very gradually. And sometimes you need the brightness in the room to cross a certain threshold before you see, wow, this room is full of people. It's full of chairs, tables, wonderful books. And I should just take a moment to thank my sponsor, Books and Books, here in Coral Gables. Bookstores like these are treasures at a time when online sales and Believe me, we all love them, we all need them, but we need these bookstores too because they're more than places where books are sold. They're gathering places where ideas are shared, where there is some kind of element of socialization that occurs side by side with people who love books and love learning. So thank you for hosting this event. In any event, um, back to the image of the room that's gradually getting brighter all of a sudden you see everything. Now what I'm hoping to do in Supermind is to tell you that you are in this room. So watch out as the light gradually gets turned on because if you're sensitized that you're gonna see these things, you're gonna see them much sooner. You're gonna see them much earlier. You're gonna say, wow, here's a little change. There's a little change. An emergency room doctor was right there in Bethesda where I am, was learning TM. She was two or three days into her teaching. And she came into her emergency room and she thought, wow, you know, the walls look brighter. So she went to the management. She said, have you painted the walls? They said, no. Have you changed the lighting? And No, we've done nothing here. What was happening is the world just looked brighter, physically brighter, as a result of the subtle changes that were going on inside her changes that we're going to progress and gather momentum over time. Other questions? Well, yes, gentlemen there.
does does TM work better if you've got a philosophy um, that it it sort of coincides with or tallies with in some way? Well, I think the important thing to understand is that TM is a freestanding technique. It doesn't require you buying into any cosmology or any belief system, which is what's wonderful about it, because nobody need feel that it's conflicting with a pre-existing belief system or religion, that it works all by itself. That said, no practice exists in a vacuum. All of us have beliefs, practices, things we value. You know, I do yoga, for example. I exercise. Um, I think social relationships are wonderful. I think we all, this is all part of our, the lifestyle that we evolve for ourselves, and then TM fits so beautifully into all that. But the important thing to realize is that those things are not necessary for TM in order to work. It's about a week, but it's not the whole week. It's like an introductory lecture and then four days in a row of an hour, an hour and a half of personal tuition. But within a week, you can have the thing nailed. Um, well, the teacher asks you to practice at home and then come back and check in and what were your experiences like and you, you chat about it and you discuss it. And so uh, then what happens is that that teacher becomes a resource and actually for the initial investment uh, you get a lifetime of support wherever you are wherever there's a TM center you can check in with it and you never are charged again uh, because it's a sort of sense that you've invested in the system and uh, but the initial one is about a week okay yes talking about me personally or just in general well you know I love writing a book because it it forces me to read all kinds of things I don't think I would have read William James's varieties of religious experience if I hadn't written this book I wouldn't have read uh, Stanislas de Haen's Science of Consciousness um, nor necessarily do I recommend that you do um, right now, I, I mean, I read anything that is fascinating and that intrigues me and that expands my mind. And right now I'm reading a book called Sapiens, as in Homo Sapiens, which is an anthropological history of the human species. And so I think, I, I think the fewer directions, instructions, mandates that we give, and the more we say, you know, go out, enjoy your lives, do the things you want to do, but just allow that to be infused and informed by this, you know, growth practice. Uh, you know, I think people should do whatever they want to do and read whatever they want to read. But thank you for the question. They don't like to start the actual formal technique before age 10 or 11. There are children's techniques involved involving giving them a, a magic word and letting them walk around just to kind of get into it in case they're very enthusiastic. But uh, until age 10 or 11, it's hard for children to sit and really follow through on the instruction. So, over there. Yes, yes, yes. To all of those, it's becoming more mainstream. People are understanding their different kinds of meditation. These things will be taught in psychology courses if it's not happening already. They have to be. I mean, William James was prescient when he said, no account of the universe is complete without this wisdom. So. No, no account of psychology will be deemed complete without some education. 
about the meditation and its impact. Well, thank you. Uh, one more. Any effects of TM on the motion of the spinal fluid? No, there are definitely no studies. There are some wonderful studies showing, uh, there's one study showing that uh, during actual meditation, there's an increased blood flow to the front of the brain, the part of the brain that's important for making judgments, decisions, etc., etc. So um, that, that, can ha that happens and there are other wonderful studies that I could get into, but the, the flow of the spinal fluid that I mentioned in relation to um, sleep, and then it's only been done in rats, they couldn't do it in people, but the, the um, inference is that perhaps it exists in humans as well, that's never been done for meditation. Okay, oh, one more, last one over there. You know, if you'd asked me this question when I just finished with Transcendence, I would say, if I ever threaten to write another book, take me out into the backyard and shoot me. But here we are. I'm glad nobody did that because I, I'm really, you know, it, wasn't, it was a hard thing to do. And you sacrifice a lot when you write. A book you sacrifice lunches with friends and dinner invitations and things because you're under deadline pressure but I tell you the joy of being able to share new insights with all of you and the joy of being able to say you know I think this book is going to make some people happier and not that the book will make them happier the book will show them a key to becoming happier and hopefully in enough of an enjoyable and compelling way that they might actually pick the key up, put it in the door, open it up, and there comes the Hogwarts Express or whatever and takes them to this other place that is so magical. So, you know, I don't know. It will depend. You know, I'll only write a book if, if I feel like the inspiration is there and the information is there. And right now, I can't imagine it. But five years is a long time, and who knows what will arise between now and then. And I, a lot of the new ideas I get are from people's responses to my earlier writings. So if you read the book and you find something that moves you or interests you, don't hesitate to drop me a line. My website's normanrosenthal.com. You can get the email off of it. And please follow me on Dr. Norman Rosenthal on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. You, basically, you can't really get away from me. So, <laughs> somebody up there out at the back. Well, you know... Um, the question is, is there a connection between TM and other techniques like cognitive behavior therapy or affirmations? And my first, my first thought was the old song by Mr. Rogers that the knee bone's connected to the thigh bone and everything's connected to everything else. You know, when you're dealing with the brain, everything is connected. Um, however, these are also distinct techniques and I'm a great eclecticist. When people said, are you analytic or are you cognitive behavior? In psychiatry and psychology, there's a history of this versus that. People have taken up camps and staked out claims and raised the flag. I've always felt like these things often work beautifully together. And the more you know and the more opportunities and options that you give to people, the better off they are. And I always think these things are complementary. I mean, I, I'm not blindly endorsing everything because some things may not work for certain things but theoretically they are complementary 
over here. Double dipping. What intrigued me, well, I, as I mentioned, a patient brought it to my attention. I'd done it 35 years before. And I'm just a curious guy. And when things catch my curiosity, I tend to follow up on them. I've done it with many other things. I've got eight books before this one. You can easily find them all uh, on my Wikipedia page or just by Googling me. And some are, as, as um, Bob Hope said when he handed over his joke collection to the Smithsonian, he said, here are a million jokes, some of them good. So I, I would say of my books, there are eight others, some of them good. So you figure out which ones those are. All right. I am so grateful to all of you for being here, to Steve for hosting the thing here at Books and Books, uh, for Kiki for setting it up and for being such an iconic and wonderful TM teacher and having such a great son that's a sort of living advertisement for you and the people of Coral Gables in Miami for dragging yourselves out of the gorgeous sunlight and coming and listening here. I will be very delighted to sign books and Steve will take it over from here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rosenthal. That was great. Uh, the books are for sale behind the counter. The good doctor will be sitting here signing for you. Um, if you could, when you stand up, if you could fold your chairs, that'll give us a lot of room so we could visit with the doctor. If you're watching online again, give us a call. We'll get a book signed for you. That was such a great event. Can we get another round of applause for Mr. Dr. Rosenthal, please? That was wonderful. Thank you all for coming.